right, hi. Uh, it's great to be with you today. You know, when I was growing up, uh, I was fascinated by the idea of a sixth sense, uh, the idea that there was a realm to our world beyond what you could see, smell, uh, touch, taste, and feel. Did I get all five? Because I usually mess that up. You know, I tend to like, you know, say smell twice or whatever. Um, but I was, I was fascinated by this idea that there were aspects to the world beyond what we could sense, right? And my heroes, uh, when I was growing up, had clickers that worked um, and also uh, could tap into, into that world. So, um, so they were like Spider-Man, who's got uh, Spidey sense. Um, but I had other heroes too. And they were the scientists that were using critical thinking. People like Albert Einstein and, uh, and Max Planck, the people who were using critical thinking to scientifically show us that in a very real way, there was more to the universe than what we could perceive with our five senses. And that was an idea that absolutely fascinated me. Um, so we now know, for example, thanks to their work and the others that have come after, that we only observe about 4% of the universe. Okay, 96% of our universe is missing. Uh, we know that it's there because it has to be uh, for our equations to hold true, but we don't know that much about it. We refer to it as dark matter uh, or dark energy, and we're starting to learn more and more about it through science. But the fascinating thing to me is the potential we perhaps have in time to evolve the senses we need to perceive those parts of the universe that we can't currently. Uh, so if you look at our sense of sight, for example, the human eye is a fascinating organ. Okay, And in the back of your eye, you've got a retina, and there's a special kind of cell that's floating around in your retina. We call them cone cells. And in the human eye, there are three kinds of cone cells, uh, red, green, and blue cone cells that detect those various frequencies of light. See, we've learned that in a very real way, the universe is made up of radiation. It's all electromagnetic radiation of varying frequencies. The air you're breathing right now, the chair you're sitting on, uh, the light that's entering your eyes, it's all radiation of variant, variable frequencies. Now, when light enters your eyes, you can only detect red, green, or blue. So when something like yellow enters your eyes, it excites the red and the green cone cells. And that message gets sent to your brain, and your brain detects something that's kind of red and kind of green, and it mixes that into yellow in the back of your brain which is a fascinating process. And by mixing those three colors, we make up all the other colors uh, that us human beings are able to perceive. Now, in the animal kingdom, we've got three cone cells. Other animals are different. So dogs, for example, have two different kinds of cone cells in their eyes. They've got uh, a blue cone cell, and then what some articles say is a reddish, yellowish cone cell, which in my world is orange, right? <laughs> kind of red, kind of yellow, that's orange to me. So when you were growing up, you might have been told that dogs see the world in black or white. Did anybody get told that growing up? Not true, okay? Dogs see colors, they just see a lot less of the colors that we see. They can see anything that their brains can make up using blue and orange uh, as a basis for their cone cells. So, you know, it sucks to be a dog, I guess. But if you're a mantis shrimp, uh, you have an advantage over human beings, okay? They don't have two cone cells. They don't have three cone cells. Not five. Not ten. They have 16 different cone cells in their eyes, okay? And it gets more amazing than that because they're also able to detect what's called circularly polarized light. We have no idea what that looks like. To a human being, it just looks like a glare. We don't know anything about circularly polarized light and how it might be useful as something that you could see. But our friend the mantis shrimp is able to see it, okay? And a whole range of colors that we don't have words for, that we can't even imagine. It must look like a nuclear explosion of colors. I'm also told that uh, they're delicious with some lemon and garlic butter. <laughs> but... Um, but the mantis shrimp sees a world that we can't see, okay? And that fascinates me. Now, the frustrating thing about being a biological organism is that you can, in a very real way, develop superpowers. To us, the mantis shrimp has superpowers, okay? Um, but for us to get there, we'd have to evolve those extra cone cells in our eyes. And unfortunately for biological organisms, Evolution is something that happens quite slowly in organisms. It takes millions of years for us to evolve new things that are being selected for in our environment. We understand how evolution works, and the one thing we can say about it is it's very slow, okay? 
Fortunately, we've come up with other things that don't evolve so slowly. So if you look at our computers, for example, the ENIAC was one of the first computers. It was super slow, very little capacity in it, okay? And that was about 50 years ago. So over five decades, we've gone from this to surprise, surprise, the things that you all carry around in your pockets right now um, that are hundreds of thousands of times more powerful than an ENIAC computer. In five decades, the evolution of digital technology has been exponential. While our biological evolution is incremental, it's very slow, okay? Um, so that technology enables us to do a trick that we can't do with our biological tools, okay? We can exponentially grow these things to develop their own kinds of superpowers over time and to detect things that we can't otherwise do. We all run around now with these supercomputers in our pockets, uh, and for example, you've got more computing power in your pants right now than the International Space Station when it first launched, okay? It's amazing what you can do with what's in your pants in the 21st century, all right? So what do we do with these things? We've connected them up, and our information systems have taken on a kind of a life of their own. The internet today, in a very real way, resembles a neural network that transports three quintillion bytes of data every day. Yeah, you say shoot, but you don't know what that means. It's a number so big. But when you look at the effects of what that does, okay, it, it kind of rings, it, it, it makes sense. So in the last two years, 90% uh, of the data that we have today was generated, okay, which is a massive statement. If you go back to the dawn of writing 6,000 years ago when human beings started uh, recording information in a really meaningful way for each other, between then and the Renaissance in 1500, we roughly doubled the amount of recorded knowledge in the world, okay? Between 1500 and the year 2000, turn of the millennium, we doubled the amount of recorded knowledge we had in the world again. Between 2000 and 2010, we did the same trick again, and we will have done the same trick again between 2000, 2010 and 2015, doubling the amount of knowledge in the world with the help of our supercomputer friends that we all carry around now. That's what exponentially gaining technology enables us to do. And like I said, it, in a very real way, it resembles a brain, okay? Uh, our information systems, not the internet per se, but our integrated information systems on the internet, some of them in a very real way are starting to resemble a neural network. There's cognition happening in those systems. Now a brain is cool, a brain can do a lot of cool things, but it's not much use without sense organs, okay? Your brain can't do very much without your eyes, your ears, uh, and the other receptors that you have that enable your senses. So what's happened that fascinates me uh, over the last few years is we've started to enable these global brains with their own form of sensors. We've started in a very real way giving them the ability to see the world, okay? So we've got sensors for just about anything right now that we can make digital. Uh, Arduino boards and the open hardware movement are enabling us to do things like to take moisture in soil, and they're enabling citizens to go and plug them in all over the place, giving these information systems eyes and ears and the things that it needs to see what's happening on our planet. So what do you do when you know what's happening on the planet? Well, it starts with seeing, right? So the first thing we do is we give these systems <laughs> the ability to see what's happening. Now, if you look at the phone that's in your pocket, uh, there are various examples of how that's being applied to everyday life. So, for example, our information systems are able to see what the traffic flow is like in the cities that we live, and they're able to bring us that information. It starts with seeing. The next step is knowing, okay? Once the information systems can see the information they think we need, they're able to get to know us, all right? They bring us context. Uh, and when they've got context for us, they get down to a segmentation of one. It's not about the information that helps us collectively, it's about the information that helps individuals, okay? When I know you, I can determine what the traffic to your house looks like instead of just giving you an overall view of the traffic in your city. The next logical step is that once our information systems know us well enough and have enough context for us, they can start being us. Okay, they can start making decisions for us, and they can start bringing us answers to questions that we don't even know we should be asking, all right? Our information systems, if they know we're running late for a meeting as a result of the traffic, because they know our calendar as well, can start telling the people in that meeting that we are running late, 
okay? They can go and flip off virtually people on the internet who they know we would be very upset with based on the comments that we've made before. So, you see, we like to think of ourselves as fleshy bags of magic, but really, we're organic machines that are pretty predictable once you know enough about us, okay? If you look at the patterns of our behavior, uh, the things that we've done repeatedly, they tend to repeat themselves, and when you have enough context about us and the world we live in and the things that we're planning to do in a very real way, you can start preempting our behavior. So that excites me. But I want to leave you uh, thinking about the dark patches of the internet, all right? There are people out there who we glibly refer to as the other four billion. There's seven billion people on the planet today. Only 2.7 billion of us have access to the internet. So when we talk about a global brain and its growing awareness of us as a species, and more importantly, of individuals and their needs, there's a big dark area, okay, that isn't being seen or understood at all. So today, I want to introduce the internet to the other four billion. Internet, meet other four billion. Okay, they have problems that you could be solving too. I'm sure they'd love to Instagram pictures of their lunches, but some of them need to know where their next lunch is coming from first. They've got amazing problems for the internet and our new information systems to solve. And I thought that was an idea worth sharing with you, so thank you for allowing me to do so. Bye-bye. <laughs>